Maybe that. Yes. Yeah, we're missing a lot of people yet. Oh, how's the volume? Good? All right, we'll give people another couple minutes to get in. But in the meantime, there's a couple of, uh, couple of web addresses here. Uh, this one, the home NFS3 SMR3105. This, these are uh, directories we all have access to. So Yevgeny has put his slides for Unix on here under his directory, Istanbul. And I imagine that some of the rest of us will also put our slides in similar places. So I'll, I'll put mine there. Uh, by the time we're done here. There's another address here. And actually, there's some more material here. Hyun, which material is this? Part? Oh, from the posters. Abstracts. Oh, poster abstracts. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, there, there are actually a number of directories under this one, the home NFS3-3105. And those will be useful in, in the uh, laboratories as well. Okay, it looks like we have a quorum. So time, uh, time to switch topics a bit. Now we're going to talk about radiation transport. So here's a, here's a brief outline of what we'll cover in the lecture today and the lecture tomorrow. Let's see if I got this. Uh... All right, so we'll, we'll start basically defining what we mean by radi how we're going to describe the radiation field the assumptions that we're making in describing the radiation. Talk about, you know, get the terminology down so that we know what we're talking about because there's lots of different ways to approach this topic. We'll then move on to talk about the radiation transport equation in a fairly simple way. Talk about a simple solution which gives you some ideas of the effects that you can see from the radiation transport, uh, which will be useful when we get in further into the topic, uh, describing how we actually get a radiation transport solution, and then tie that to the material radiative properties, the absorption, emission, and scattering, which we've been hearing about so far this week. So then finally, after we do that, which are all the preliminaries to doing the radiation transport, we'll talk about doing coupled systems. Coupled systems meaning either an LTE or a non-LTE atomic system plus the radiation. So at that point, we'll make, a, we'll make a connection back to the collisional radiative models that we've just been talking about. So we'll get through most of this, maybe all of this part today. And in the next lecture, we'll do the rest of it, where we'll talk about some more details about the line radiation and how you actually get a solution to, a solu to this system of equations and what that solution might look like. So that's where a lot of the information will be. So first, basic assumptions, how we're going to describe the radiation. So this is sort of a classical slash semi-classical description. We'll be talking about a radiation field described either in terms of the specific intensity, and I'll describe what that is, or we'll talk about the photon distribution function. And these two will have exactly the same information in there. So for simplicity, we'll make the assumption that we're talking about unpolarized radiation, we're going to neglect, for right now, at least index of refraction effects, which means that the index of refraction will assume it's one. Photons will travel in straight lines. 
okay, scattering, we'll talk about scattering some, but actually the scattering that we'll be concerned about here is not really true scattering, like Thompson scattering or Compton scattering, Rayleigh scattering, those things, but it'll be sort of an effect of scattering, which is very important for non-LTE plasmas. So we'll get into that. And for right now, at least, uh, we'll be talking about material which has no significant velocities. So one difference between this topic and what we've talked about so far is we've been talking about plasmas in the form of, you know, a plasma at a single point in space. So we've got a, a single piece of material and we've been talking about the properties of that material. So now we're going to put together properties of different pieces of material. So we have to worry about, one, the spatial distribution and the velocity distribution of the material. So first, the radiation description. So two different descriptions. So the macroscopic description is in terms of the specific intensity, which is the energy traveling uh, per unit area, per unit solid time, per unit uh, per time within a given frequency range. And so this, so the energy, which is crossing a unit surface, so here's a unit surface going in a direction denoted by omega. Uh, the normal to the surface is denoted by this, this uh, unit vector n. Is This is the area crossing this surface in a particular amount of time. So it's the area, the solid angle, the frequency interval, the amount of time, and then the the direction, the normal to the area. In terms of a microscopic description, the same information is here in the photon distribution function. So I'll be talking about the photon distribution function, then the photons have positions in space, in momentum, and of course it's time dependent as well. So the intensity is related to the photon distribution function. The intensity is, it's the sum over spins, of the photon distribution function. Instead of a distribution function, number of particles, we're talking about energy. So each of the photons gets multiplied by its energy, h nu. And so there's this relationship between the photon intensity, the specific intensity, and the distribution function. Because again, since we're talking about uh, index of refraction one, the momentum is just h nu over c times the direction. A couple moments of the distribution function uh, are important at various times here. So again, the zeroth moment we'll be talking about is just integrating the specific intensity at a given point in space, actually averaging it over all solid angles. <coughs> so this, in a sense, is the energy density carried by the radiation. Actually, in this definition, is the energy density times the factor C over 4 pi. So when you read books and articles about photon intensities and moments, you have to be careful about exactly how they're defined. There are a few different common definitions, and they differ in what they do with the factors of 4 pi and what they do with the, with the factors of C as to whether this is actually an energy density or it's an energy density times the speed of light. So we've got the zeroth moment, which gives us the energy density. We've got the first moment which gives us the flux. And we've got the second moment, which looks like a pressure tensor, for those of you who are familiar with those terms. For isotropic radiation, uh, then the pressure tensor is, turns out to be diagonal with a factor of one-third here, which looks like the pressure is one-third the energy density. And so in that sense, radiation looks like an ideal gas of particles with a gamma of four-thirds. Now we've already heard about what the thermal distribution, the equilibrium distribution of radiation is. It's the Planck function, which was derived in previous lectures. Uh, we can view this in another way, is that the photon distribution function, photons are bosons. And so this is the Bose-Einstein distribution. And again, the difference between the, the photon distribution function and the Planck function is just this factor of 2h nu cubed over c squared. So we can view this in either, either direction. And then the total energy density, integrating this overall frequencies, if the photons have a distribution uh, characterized by a temperature T sub r, is just this at to the fourth. Now, to, 
give you some feeling for what kind of energy density there is in radiation if we take an electron temperature equal to a radiation temperature. And for hydrogen, say the temperature or the density is 10 to the 23rd per cubic centimeter, which is roughly solid density for hydrogen, uh, then the energy in radiation and the energy in matter are about the same at a temperature of 300 EV, which is a reasonably high temperature for most laboratory plasmas, or it was until recently. We now routinely produce laboratory plasmas with temperatures 10 times this. Uh, and the important thing about this radiation is that the material energy density increases linearly with radiation, whereas the radiation energy density increases as the fourth power of radiation. So as this temperature increases, the amount of energy density in the radiation increases very fast. So we'll see later on that the radiation has two important effects when we're talking about its effect on the plasma. Uh, one reason we're, we're talking about radiation transport here is that, of course, the radiation carries the information we see about the plasma. We've talked about the, the spectral lines that come out of a plasma and the, the emission distributions out of a plasma. But for that information to get to us, we need to see it come through radiation. We need to receive the radiation. As the radiation is going through the plasma, it has an effect on the plasma in two different ways. So one is that the radiation will affect the plasma because it affects the transition rates. The second, when the temperature or the density gets up high enough, is the radiation actually carries a lot of energy. And so that will also change the temperature of the plasma. So we'll have to be concerned about both those effects. Now, we've already talked a few times about what LTE means, uh, is that we will mostly be assuming uh, that the radiation is not an equilibrium, that the radiation does not have this distribution, this equilibrium distribution function, but it could be possible that the plasma is an LTE, that the particles have thermal distributions. So there are two main branches of radiation transport which deal with cases where the material is an LTE and when the material is not an LTE. So here is the basic simplest form of the radiation transport equation, which is maybe a little more understandable if we look at it as an equation for the photon distribution function, in which case the radiation transport equation is just a Boltzmann equation for the photon distribution function. There's a, temperature, there's a time derivative term. There's a spatial derivative term. Uh, there's no momentum derivative term because there's no body force on the photons. And then on the right-hand side, there's a collision term. Now, in the Boltzmann equation uh, formulation, we would talk about a collision term. In the radiation transport equation, the collision term is the interactions of the photons with the plasma. And so we've already talked about some of these, the, the emission uh, We've talked about line emission a fair amount, which is excited states, uh, de-exciting producing photons. Uh, radiative recombination produces photons. So those things will show up as emission. There's also photon absorption. Photons will get absorbed as they go through the plasma. So these, transi these transitions will uh, attenuate the, absorb the radiation as it goes through. So we'll talk more in detail about these in a few slides. So basically, uh, the absorption coefficient and the emissivity, the emission coefficient, will relate to the cross sections that we've talked about earlier. And then the transport equation, this left-hand side is just describing radiation flowing in phase space, uh, completely conservative, just photons making their way through phase space. The right-hand side talks about interactions with the material, so absorption and emission, and this depends on all the atomic physics. And note that photon number in these transitions, in these interactions, is not conserved, except for the case of true scattering. Now, there's a very simple form for the radiation equation, radiation transport equation, which is called the characteristic form. And if we take, if we go back to the radiation transport equation, divide the equation through by the absorption coefficient, again, which is different for each frequency, 
And write this along a characteristic, uh, a straight line, so photons going along a straight line in a particular direction, then the radiation transport becomes just this, is now we've defined, uh, we, we've defined a, a distance, not in terms of physical distance, but in distance times absorption coefficient, which is the optical depth. The interactions with the radiation, interactions with the material are now, the absorption is, is hidden in terms of the optical depth. The emission, however, is hidden in terms of what's called the source function, which is the emission coefficient divided by the absorption coefficient. And the characteristic radiation transport equation has this very simple form. Now, there's one more complication hidden in here, and that's the time derivative. And the time, the time dependence is hidden in here because along the characteristic form, then everything along the, in the solution of this equation has to be evaluated at retarded times. Now, radiation travels pretty fast, and in most cases, it'll be sufficient to just ignore that time dependence and treat this in steady, in steady state, meaning that the photons travel with infinite speed, effectively. Now, two things about this. One, in LTE, uh, the source function, the, the ratio of the emission to the absorption coefficient, just gives you the Planck function. Now, this is true. Th this comes about by detailed balance, and it's true in each radiative transition independently, which means that it's also true in total. So this will be very useful later on. Now, the simple form of the equation, that's... I mean, each of us could solve this equation very simply. It's a first order linear differential equation. And so we can just write down the solution here, which is we can, we can talk about this characteristic solution and get some properties of what happens through radiation transport. So there's, there's a few important features here. One, this tells you explicitly that the intensity that you see at some point and we'll call this, this point zero, or actually the, the intensity that we're looking for here, which could be at some detector, is given by the intensity which is starting at some point zero, which could be, say, the other side of our plasma. And then what we actually see is an integral over the emission going through the plasma, the emission from each point of the plasma, attenuated by the optical depth of the observation point. So, these diagnostics that we see from, from plasmas in the low temperature limit, they're, they're very nice, or, or rather in the low density limit, we know what they mean. Now, and if the plasma is optically thin, meaning that the optical depth is very small, then that should be pretty much what, the, what we see. In the very, limit of very thin, small optical depth, this just becomes uh, the source function times the optical depth, the optical depth then is just a constant absorption coefficient times, times the width of the plasma. And that then gives you the emissivity of the plasma, the emission coefficient times the depth. So it's got exactly the same form as the emission from a point in space. So those are reasonably easy to interpret. Once you go through plasma which has a finite optical depth, and the different points in the plasma might have different physical conditions, temperatures and densities, it becomes more, it becomes more difficult to interpret the spectrum you see. So the important things here is that, you know, what we see coming out is we see radiation from different points in the plasma weighted differently according to the optical depth. Most of the radiation we see comes from within an optical depth about one of the surface of the plasma. Because the radiation coming from deeper into the plasma uh, is attenuated quite a bit. Now that optical depth one happens at different points in the plasma for different frequencies. So the spectrum we see actually is sampling different points in the plasma very differently. Now, this looks like a fairly simple equation to solve, but the other complication here is that the source function, the properties of the plasma itself, depend on the radiation. Now, this is a lot simpler if the radiation is an LTE, in which case the source function only depends on temperature. If the source function 
depends not just on temperature, but on density and the intensity, then we have to fold that in and we have to get a self-consistent solution for the properties of the plasma according to the radiation field at that point in the plasma and the physical conditions and this radiation transport equation. So this is the hard part of doing radiation transport, is getting a self-consistent solution for the source function and the intensity. So let's look at a couple limiting cases here. I think I've already said this in words. If it's optically thin, the optical depth is much less than one. The intensity we see is just an integral over the source function, which then just becomes the emission coefficient times the length of the plasma, the depth of the plasma. And then what we see just reflects the conditions of the plasma, independent of what the absorption is. If it's optically thick, then we see something just coming from within an optical depth of the surface. So what we see is the source function at an optical depth of roughly one. So if the source, so what we see then doesn't reflect the plasma over the entire length, the depth of the plasma, we see it just near the surface. Now, if this is, happens to be LTE, we know what the source function is. So what we'll see is just something that looks like a Planck function at that temperature. The other, another important limiting case that we use in the laboratory a lot is if the plasma is really not emitting, or rather if we're hitting it with an intensity which is much larger than the self-emission. In other words, we're backlighting a plasma, and we're just getting characteristics of the absorption. So in that case, there is no integral here, and what we see is an attenuation of the backlighting intensity, which again is different at every, at every frequency, and so this is giving the characteristics of the, of the absorption coefficient. So this gives us one view on the plasma, which is what all the absorption transitions are, whereas this limit gives us the emission transitions, so we can get some very different information off the plasma there. So in that case, then this ratio of the emission, the intensity we see divided by the backlight intensity tells us what the absorption characteristics are. So here's, here's an example. If we take a uniform plasma, and now it's a uniform sphere, and I've chosen krypton at 200 EV and a fixed density, fairly low density, and the important thing here now is that this is an LTE. So the emission and absorption characteristics of the plasma do not depend on the radiation intensity. They only depend on intensity and density, and I have fixed those. So at 200 EV, this black curve here is the flux we would get from a black body. This is the Planck distribution. But what, what is the intensity we see? for this amount of plasma. So the intensity we see is given here by this blue line. So we see some very strong transitions. Uh, 500 EV, okay, it's a, it's a, the strong transitions will be at a couple times the temperature, most likely the, if we looked at the uh, ionization balance of this plasma, we, we would probably find that it's ionized up to something which is probably a couple kilovolts of ionization energy. And this is an LTE plasma. So, I mean, people use the term roughly that this is emitting as a black body. But that doesn't mean that what you see is a black body because this is not an optically thick plasma. So the optical depths are displayed over here. Notice this is a log scale. So the optical depth here, uh, this is four orders of magnitude difference from transitions. These are transitions in the K shell. These are transitions in the L shell. This may well be uh, neon-like krypton here, trans strong transitions, which are giving this, this, this emission here. And of course, the emission in each one of these transitions, since this is an LTE, from the, from the absorption coefficient, which is this divided by the distance, uh, if we multiply that by the Planck function at that energy, we will get the emission, the, the emission coefficient. So this is not optically thick in any transition. And notice that the intensity that we see comes nowhere close to the black body limit. 
if we now increase the size of the sphere by an order of magnitude. So conditions are just the same. All I've changed is the size of the sphere. Now we're saying, okay, now what do we see? So the intensity distribution is quite different. One, there's a lot more intensity because just because we've got a lot more plasma to look at. But now the optical depths are 100 times larger. So particularly the optical depths up here in the K shell are pretty significant. Uh, they vary from one up to nearly 100. And if we look up here in the kilovolt range, then we see the intensity actually is, in some cases, limiting to the black body intensity. So we're seeing optically thick emission here. For these thick lines here, in, in whatever, whatever transitions these are, we also see emission up here, which is limiting to the black body emission. But most of the plasma is still not optically thick. And so we, we see a very different spectral output from different regions of the plasma, depending on exactly what the optical depth is. Now, if we take this larger by another factor of 100, now we're getting some really significant optical depths here. So optical depths up about 1,000 up to nearly 10,000 here. And we have a large amount of black body emission so that the flux we actually see does, is starting to look uh, like that from a black body. Notice there are still, uh, still deviations from black body here because a lot of the transitions, there's still holes here in the transmission spectrum, in the optical depth spectrum. Uh, there are some regions here which still have optical depth roughly one. The lesson from this is that if you expect to see black body uh, emission, a black body flux, you really need pretty significant optical depths. You know, a thousand would be a good, good optical depth before you can expect to see really black body emission here. So what we see in laboratory plasmas, particularly the plasmas that we're heating up to kilovolt energies, is they will be nowhere near black body distributions. And what we'll, see, what we'll be seeing is emission which has characteristics. Some, some of the emission will be optically thick. Some of the emission will be optically thin. So the total spectrum we'll have to interpret very carefully. Now, this is also, this is one reason why in planning experiments, you must take into account the optical depth that you expect to get in the experiment. Because the lower the optical depth, the easier it will be to interpret the experiment in terms of plasma conditions, temperature and density. However, the lower the optical depth, the less emission you will also get because the less plasma that you will be looking at. And so there's, there's a balance between the two that we try to reach. The ideal experiment would have zero optical depth, but again, be large enough so that we could, we could um, see the emission. So now let's go talk about the absorption and emission coefficients, which we actually have already done through the other lectures. So again, what these describe macroscopically is how the energy in a frequency range changes as the radiation passes through a material. The energy is removed from the radiation by absorption. And so this, this alpha sub nu, the absorption coefficient, just describes that absorption. And the material also emits radiation. The microscopic description of this is the radiative transitions that some of the other lectures have already talked about. And these absorption and emission coefficients are constructed from the atomic populations and the cross sections. So again, we, ha we have radiative excitations and de-excitations, ionizations, uh, uh, radiative recombinations, and anything here uh, which can produce, so as Yuri was talking about, collisional excitations, ionizations will give you excited states. The excited states most likely will excite radiatively or radiative recombination. Dielectronic recombination can also produce radiation. So figuring out how much emission you've got depends critically on what the populations of, of these levels are. So here are expressions for the absorption coefficient and, and the emission coefficient in terms of the cross sections. And this is now summed over each of the transitions. Now, the absorption is given, is given by 
absorption of a photon as it goes from a lower state to an upper state. We also traditionally include stimulated, uh, stimulated emission in here uh, for the reason that this is stimulated emission is also proportional to the photon field. And so it comes into the radiation transport equation as a term multiplying the intensity. So we lump these together as, as a total absorption of coefficient. The emission is given by the spontaneous, spontaneous recombination, spontaneous emission, so the spontaneous rates here. So again, to calculate these quantities, we need the, we need the, uh, tr all the transition uh, cross sections as a function of energy, and we also need the populations of all the levels. So just a quick review of the various transitions that are in there. So this is stuff that you've already seen is we've got bound bound transitions in there and these are the ones just described by the Einstein coefficients uh, proportional to an, the absorption and simulated emission are both proportional to an integral over the radiation field. And these, these Einstein coefficients are just simply related, related by this, uh, this quantity. There's one other thing that comes in here is we've been describing so far these transitions as having a single discrete energy. Now we know that that's not true. There will, there will be several factors which give some width, some energy width to this transition. Uh, and actually that's been mentioned a couple times already. So that line profile, we need to dis fully describe this transition, we need a line profile which measures the probability of absorption as a function of frequency. And then the transition rate will be the integral of the radiation field over this probability. So this, this, this uh, quantity we term J bar is that integral over the line profile. And we'll talk a little bit later about exactly what goes into that line profile. So we've got the bound bound transitions uh, the cross-section for absorption then looks like this. So we've got the cross-section in terms of, this is in terms of the Einstein coefficient. Uh, we also determine, uh, can describe this cross-section in terms of the oscillator strength. So there's a characteristic size here, pi e squared over mc, which is actually the classical absorption. Uh, if you're doing classical E and M and looking at a, a harmonic oscillator, this would be the absorption cross-section per frequency. Uh, and the oscillator strength then relates the transition, the quantum mechanical transition, to this classical treatment. So a strong transition should have an oscillator strength of roughly order unity. Uh, there are many weak transitions, so the oscillator strengths will get very small for the weak transitions. And then there are some rules which describe what the total oscillator strength is. Uh, the most important of which is that the sum over all the transitions gives you just the number of bond electrons. And from that, we get the absorption and emission coefficients. Again, the absorption coefficient has this absorption piece, and it also has the stimulated emission piece. Whereas in the emission, we'll put the spontaneous uh, spontaneous emission part. And for right now, we'll assume that the absorption and emission use the same line profile. That's a simplification that we'll talk about maybe in, in the next lecture. But it's, it's usually a pretty good approximation to assume that there's only one line profile here. Now, then there's the bound-free absorptions. Uh, and, and here, of course, we're doing an ionization, and so you need a photon of some threshold energy, and largely the cross-section for these uh, falls off as a, as a function of frequency above that transition, and in hydrogenic transitions, it's, it's one over nu cubed once you get away from the threshold. And so roughly, you can describe the bound-free cross-section as some, uh, some threshold cross-section, times this one over nu cubed factor, times a factor which talks about, so this is the absorption and this is the stimulated emission piece of it. There's a, this gaunt factor uh, takes up the, the difference between this description and the exact quantum mechanical description, and there's some approximate expressions for this which actually work pretty well. And then it is roughly dependent on the principal quantum number. So this, 
again, is a, is a continuum transition, starts at some threshold and, and then goes on to high, intent, to high frequency. Also, free free absorption or, or bremsstrahlung. And again, here there's an absorption cross section per ion, which again goes roughly as one over nu cubed. And in both these cases, I've been assuming that the electrons have a Maxwellian distribution that's described by a temperature. So that I can take account of this spunt or the stimulated emission term just by an exponential e to the minus h nu over kt. And the same thing shows up in, in the free free absorption coefficient. And then there's scattering. So there's true scattering. And that's been mentioned before. So that's an interaction in which the photon energy is mostly conserved. But really, it's, it's conserving the photon number. So scattering by bound electrons gives you Rayleigh scatter, scattering. Free electrons is either Thompson or Compton scattering. Compton scattering if the, if the photon energy is high enough uh, so that it's essentially relativistic and a significant amount of energy gets given to the, to the electron. At lower energies, it's a constant cross-section. So there's a frequency shift from the scattering, which is of order the, you know, the photon energy to the electron rest mass energy in this case. Uh, for most laboratory plasmas, these are negligible. The cross-section is pretty small, you know, 10 to the minus 24th per square centimeter. So to get an optical depth, a reasonable optical depth of that, you need something which has a pretty high density and a pretty significant size. So in most cases, in laboratory plasmas, we'll, we'll neglect this. Except for there's, there's, a, there's a field of X-ray Thompson scattering, where now they're scattering off ion acoustic waves and plasma oscillations, which actually turns out to be a very useful diagnostic for plasmas. But this is kind of a separate topic. Uh, but there's been a lot of work on that in like the last 10 or 20 years. Now, there's another type of scattering. Well, first, let's talk about how the scattering goes into the radiation transport equation. So the simple radiation transport equation I gave you before, again, had some more details hidden in it. And those details were hidden in what I was calling the emission coefficient here. Because this absorption coefficient is the thing which is proportional to the amount of energy taken out of the incident radiation. And anything else gets tossed into the, the emission coefficient. And so I wasn't explicitly displaying something like scattering here, which has a form like this, which now looks, will probably look more familiar to plasma physicists, something like a Boltzmann collision term. So now we've got a cross section. We've got a redistribution function which says, OK, here's the probability of taking a photon from this direction and this frequency to this direction and this frequency. So we get scattering both in and out of the intensity, which now is headed in a specific which we're considering a specific intensity in a specific direction. And we're getting contributions into and out of that intensity from radiation going different directions and at different frequencies. And there are, there are both uh, straightforward scattering terms and stimulated scattering terms in here. So this is a, a nonlinear part of the uh, radiation transport equation. And this redistribution function describes the scattering. So there are actually a few different forms of this redistribution function describing different forms of scattering. And again, we will we'll talk some about this when we talk about uh, when we talk about line profile functions, but we'll mostly neglect this for true scattering. Now, if we first make the first approximation that the photons are not changing energy, we can simplify this. Uh, to this form. So if we uh, make the approximation that this redistribution function is a delta function in terms of frequencies, we can integrate over the frequencies. It comes down to this. So it looks, now it looks like a phase factor, which is just scattering radiation from one direction into another direction. And again, if this is isotropic, we can integrate over this phase function. Uh, and just get a form like this, which just says, OK, now we've got something a little bit different for the radiation. We've got two additional terms. This was the absorption we had before. This was the emission we had before. 
and now we've got a term which says we're scattering radiation out of our out of our frequency and direction, actually out of our direction since we've set it the same frequency, and we're scattering radiation in from other directions. Notice now that now, now this form is the is the radiation averaged over all angles. Now if we keep the phase function in here for Thompson scattering, it has the form of 1 plus cos squared theta. So we could have something slightly more complicated here and still put that into the radiation transport equation. So we can, uh, we can write the transport equation either explicitly displaying these terms, the scattering terms, or we can kind of implicitly include these in the absorption and the emission. And depending on, on how you're treating the scattering, you'll see very different treatments in the literature. If the scattering is very important to you, such as it is in, in Compton scattering, high energy Compton scattering, and astrophysics Comptonization, they'll treat this explicitly in, in great detail because that's the physics they care about. If you're seeing this in a laboratory plasma, uh, you might not see scattering included at all. If you see it in scattering in solar physics, uh, where there certainly is enough density and, and optical depth and scattering for this to be important, then you'll see it probably in this kind of an approximation. But there's a different kind of scattering that we need to be concerned about, even if we have a plasma which does not have enough depth and enough density to worry about true scattering. And that is effective scattering. So that comes about via, via transitions, absorption and emission in the plasma. So consider a, a two-level case. So a two-energy level system where this upper level, we know it can decay radiatively or it can be disrupted collisionally. So if we get, if we get an absorption from the lower level to the upper level, and this is a low density system, most often what is going to happen is this system is going to radiatively de-excite and emit another photon. And this might happen numerous times before that, that photon actually gets absorbed. Now occasionally then, this photon uh, or this system will not radiatively de-excite, but it will be collisionally de-excited, either collisionally de-excited or it will be collisionally excited to some other level. So there's a fraction of the photons that will be destroyed. Now, when this happens, the photons that are destroyed, are, are they, they're basically talking to the thermal electron background, and they will be, in a sense, thermalized. However, the rest of the photons, they're just going, going through the plasma, they're being absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted. Each time they come out, uh, they can have a slightly different frequency within the line profile, and they can have a different, they can have a different direction. So these photons are being scattered. So this is the effect of scattering which is going on, and this is a very strong effect in low density plasmas. So these photons can undergo very many of these scatterings before being thermalized, given by this ratio. And again, this ratio is here's, here's this ratio C to one is the collisional excitation rate, and it's proportional to the electron density. So the lower the density, the lower this fraction is, and the more scatterings this photon will go through before it manages to, to exit the plasma or before it gets thermalized. So the photon can go actually a very long distance then before it becomes thermalized. So this is the condition for a strongly non-LTE transition. And again, it's easily satisfied for low density because this is proportional to the, the electron density or for very high energy photons because this radiative transition probability increases as the energy to the energy squared or energy cubed. So this, this number, the, trans, the radiative transition um, rate uh, increases strongly with energy. So if we're looking at high energy transitions here, this is a very strong effect. Okay, so now if we want to actually start looking at radiation transport, we, uh, we know how to calculate transitions. Uh, we know what the radiation transport equation is. 
but we need to talk about the population distributions. And Yuri talked about this in his lectures. If we're in LTE, then we know that the population distributions follow saha boltzmann equation. So the excited states within an ionization state uh, follow a Boltzmann distribution according to their excitation energy. And the ionization stages obey the Saha equation, which is that the, uh, the population of one ionization stage related to the next one is just given by a ratio of the partition functions of the two charge states. And actually, the electron density times this factor is the partition function for the thermal electrons. So this is straightforward thermodynamics. It's a ratio of partition functions. Now, if the material is not in LTE, so the case we're mostly concerned about non-LTE, then we get the population distributions from the collisional radiative model. So we take the rate equations here, uh, which here we talked about. Take this rate equation, and here I'm just talking about, I've got a simpler rate equation here. I've, I'm neglecting other sources or other physics which might come in here. So in my transitions here, I've got collisional transitions, radiative transitions, these other transitions like auto ionizations. Uh, you've seen this expression for the collisional excitations where we take the electron distribution function, integrate it over velocities to get the rates here. We do a similar integral over rates and cross sections for the radiation field. And now we have a non-zero radiation field. So to get the radiative rates, we take the radiation field for an excitation or ionization. We take the cross section as a function of frequency, multiplied by the radiation field at that frequency, and integrate over frequency. Now notice what I've gotten here is not the specific intensity, but it's the, it's the uh, it's the angle integrated intensity. Uh, in most cases, this is what couples to the plasma. So we're talk, uh, we just need the number of photons at that frequency, and we don't really care what direction they're going. If there's a strong magnetic field on, then we would probably care about the direction. But in most cases, we can use the angle, angle integrated, the angle average intensity. So again, just like for the electrons, we take the cross section, we integrate over the number of photons which is why this is J nu divided by H nu to get back to the distribution function of number of photons and integrate that. For the inverse process, we take the inverse uh, cross section, again, times the photon distribution, and now we've got the spontaneous and the, or the spontaneous term here and the stimulated term. And we integrate over this distribution to get the inverse rate. So now we've got a, a collisional radiative model where the rates here depend explicitly on the radiation density. And we've got the radiation transport equation where the coefficients depend on this. So in summary, so now we can write down an expression for all the aspects of the radiation transport equation. We've got the absorption coefficients and now we sum these over all the populations and all the radiative transitions, including the, uh, the stimulated terms. And again, the stimulated terms here uh, for both the, the bound free and the free free terms. In this case, we've assumed that the electrons have Maxwellian distribution. So the stimulated terms look like e to the minus h nu over kt here. For the bound free transitions, then we have to explicitly put in the populations of those states. So we've got the absorption coefficient and then the emission coefficient here is all, this, all these spontaneous terms. And in LTE, then these are kind of complex absorption and emission coefficients, but we know what the, we know what the populations are as a function of temperature and density. And we know that the source function is equal to the Planck function at that temperature. So that simplifies the radiation transport equation quite a bit. In non-LTE, it's quite a bit more complex. So now the source function in the radiation transport equation, it depends explicitly on the, the electron density and temperature, and also the populations which themselves depend on the radiation intensity. So this is, this is a highly coupled system here that we need to solve.
and actually this is this is probably a good uh, a good place to stop for the first lecture because after this we get into how do you treat this coupled system. So we'll we'll pick it up tomorrow at this point. <laughs>